Okay, so we're going to be talking about nematodes. And what are nematodes? Roundworms. Roundworms, yep. And I always remembered Nema is round. Um, if your name is Nema, I feel really bad and I take that back. So here's your overall um, nematodes. You're going to have uh, intestinal nematodes, and then you're going to have tissue nematodes. So your intestinal nematodes are going to be your enterobius vermicularis, your trichuris trichuria, um, ascaris lumbricoides, um, ankylo ankylostoma uh, duodenale, and nicator americanus. Um, and if you say these differently than I do, that's perfectly fine. Um, I'm sure someone um, went to school long enough to know the, the um, exact names, but if you can tell what it is and attempt really hard to say it right, then I think you'll be good. Um, Strongyloides uh, serocollis, um, Trinchinella spiralis, and Draculunus Draculus <laughs> um, metanesis are all intestinal nematodes. And then you've got tissue nematodes, um, which are your Rucheria, Bancrofti, and your Loa Loa. So they're all nematodes, um, but some of them are intestinal and some of them are tissue. And so for Enterobius vermicularis, it's going to be your pinworm. Um, your infective stage is the embryonated ovum. Your method of infection is ingestion, anal scratching, and then touching the mouth. So um, what the enterobius vermicularis does is most just reproduce in the um, system that they're in. So in this case, like the intestinal system. But the female, um, the gravid enterobius vermicularis, gravid means pregnant, will go and travel to the perianal region. So like um, right outside your butthole pretty much and will lay her eggs. And so um, the method of infection is, and it's uh, more common in children, and that's because children will scratch their butts and then go and touch their faces. Um, and so uh, the method in, of infection is ingesting, is ingestion. So anal scratching and then touching the mouth is the, is the main one. Um, diseases and symptoms, you'll have perianal itching, um, which is called pruritus ani. So pruritus ani is the itching of the anal region, um, and it's the most common helminth. So what's a helminth? Uh, uh, helminths are uh, worms. Worms, yep. So this is the Group most common pack. worm overall. Um, the method of diagnosis is a cellophane tape prep, and your key characteristics, the ova are jelly bean or C-shaped, uh, with thin outer shells and colorless. Which is the most common, you said? Enerobius vermicularis. Enerobius vermicularis. Okay, so I'll start with, um, it's an intestinal nematode. And it, actually I'll put that one down here. I think the main one to know. What's the common name for it? Enterobius vermicularis? Pinworm. 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 So your enterobius vermicularis is a pinworm. It is an intestinal nematode. The infective stage is going to be your embryonated ova. And the note I put for that out of um, remembering the infective stage for these nematodes is um, ETA, let me put that down here. ETA, which is your infective stage for 
for embryonated ova, which means enterobius, your E, and then your trichuris, which is your T, and then your ascaris is your A. And so those are all the ones out of these nematodes that have the infective stage as an embryonated ova, and then the other ones are different. So ETA is going to be your embryonated ova. And then your method of injection. I'm sorry, method of infection is going to be ingestion. And specifically for this one is going to be anal scratching. And touching mouth. Your diseases or symptoms are going to be perianal itching. And if that's not a question on your exam, I will be very surprised. It is the most common helminth. And then your diagnosis is going to be the cellophane tape prep. Did y'all learn about that? Mm -hmm. Cellophane tape prep. So the cellophane tape prep, how that works is um, you simply they take tape to the anus. Exactly. Yep. They just take a piece of tape and stick it to their um, perianal region and um, wait for overnight um, because that's when the when this gravid um, pinworm will migrate is um, generally nocturnally. And so or I, I've always learned always nocturnally, but you know, you've always got that one crazy scenario. Um, but overnight, you leave this cellophane tape over the perianal region, and then you take it off in the morning and, and check it for eggs. So if it has little eggs on it, then, um, you know, you're positive for anaerobius vermicularis. Um, so most things that you're going to um, identify, you're going to identify by ova in the stool sample. So that's something that's special about anaerobius vermicularis is that it is not diagnosed by a stool sample. It is diagnosed by the cellophane tape prep. <coughs> and then um, for key identification characteristics, um, it's mostly just going to be the ova. For what now? Um, under your key identification, char key characteristics. Um, sometimes you'll have key characteristics of the worm, sometimes of the worm and the ova, sometimes a infertile versus fertile egg, sometimes a rhabditiform larva, sometimes a filariform larva. But for this one specifically, it's just the ova. And they are jelly bean or C shaped. a thin outer shell and colorless. And I will show you all a picture. Uh, that side. There we go. So see it's got like kind of like the little jelly bean shape here. And then it's more colorless compared to some of the other ones you'll see. Um, and it has a real thin outer membrane. So this shell here is real thin. Those darker lines. And that's going to be your pinworm. So on all of these, do you really need to, do we need to know what it looks like at, at 10 and 40 on all of these? Um, I like it on there mostly because that's what I'm going to be doing in the field. Okay. Um, 
but a lot of the times, even in the field, they will have specialized people um, looking for these, looking for these parasites because they're so hard to see. So your big things for Enterobius vermicularis or pinworm, um, perianal itching with the cellophane tape prep. So that means it's not a stool sample um, and that it's the most common helmet. And then it's common in children and has a jelly bean shape. So it has a thin outer shell, but then the book says it has like a thick wall. Like what yes. the picture Let me is show you the difference. The difference. Okay, so see this, um, this black part right there? The dark part is the thin outer shell. And then the wall is this like empty part before you actually see the little embryo. So see that embryo right there? Um, and see how there's a big gap between that dark shell, that thin shell, and the actual embryo? That's okay. that wall compared to like, let me find a different one. Okay, yeah, like the whipworm, I see like just the difference between the two there. Yes, so like here's one um, where it's got a shell, but it's not as thick of a wall right there. It doesn't really look like a wall. See here, it's super thin. It's close from the from the embryo to the to the um, outer shell compared to this one having that much space between the embryo and the outer shell. Okay. And then what generation is it common in? Is it common in adults and children and immunocompromised? Children. Children. Common in children. And I want to say children under five, but I think children in general is a good enough way to, to know that. So that's anaerobius vermicularis. And then the next one's going to be your trichuris trichuria. Um, that's going to be a whipworm. Um, I will tell you all the completely inappropriate way to remember this one shortly. Yeah. Um, the infective stage is the embryonated ova. Remember your ETA, anaerobius, trichuris, and ascaris um, are all going to be the embryonated ova. The method is ingestion. Um, the diseases are symptoms often accompanied by a prolapse rectum and um, the method of diagnosis is going to be identifying an unembryonated ova in the stool sample. Then you've got your key characteristics. As an adult, they have a thin anterior, which is where the mouth is, with a thick posterior, which is considered the tail. Um, and then they have a wick, or a, I'm sorry, the anterior is the mouth. And then, yeah, I think the posterior is still the tail, but they have it a whip like curled tail. Um, I'll have to look that up because I've, when I looked it up, because I always thought of the anterior is the opposite side, but it says no, the anterior is generally the mouth, um, but they might just say it's a whip-like curled tail because it really looks like it should be the tail end. And then the ova is barrel shaped with polar plugs and a double wall. So trichuris, trichuria. Trichuris trichuria is the whipworm. So your infective stage is going to be the embryonated ova. Method is going to be ingestion. Diseases or symptoms is going to be a prolapse rectum. Got 
diagnosis is going to, do you identify embryonated or unembryonated ova? Embryonated. This one's going to be unembryonated. Identify unembryonated. Because what it does is it, um, your, you ingest the embryonated ova that grows up and has little babies of its own, um, but then it sends unembryonated ova into the stool so you can pass it and they can find their own host and live happily every, ever after. But they have to be embryonated at some point. Um, they just don't have that inside your body. Now, key characteristics. So adult has a thin anterior. with a thick posterior and a whip-like curled tail. And I'll show y'all all the pictures afterward. And then your ova. What's an ova? Do y'all know that? The egg. The egg. Yep. So your ova is the egg and then the adult is the worm. So your ova for, um, for trichuris trichuria is barrel shaped, and that is a key identifying feature um, that usually comes up on tests as well. So barrel shaped, has polar plugs, and I'll show you what those are um, when I show you the pictures as well. And then has a double wall. Now, the completely inappropriate way of remembering this. You have been fair warned. Um, it's a barrel full of whips and tricks, and that's the way we learned it in school. And that was the last time our teacher ever asked us how we remembered things. So barrel full of whips and tricks. Do you know how they call like the prostitutes and stuff tricks sometimes? So you've got your tricks for trichuris trichuria. <laughs> So oh, your barrel is going to be the, um, let me get it done. So your barrel is the ova shape, characteristic ova shape, is barrel shaped. And then your whips is in reference to your, um, the curled tail. On the adult worm, and then your tricks is going to be for trickerous trickeria. Um. And one more, inappropriate enough, if the trick gets too rough, then you can get a prolapse rectum as a symptom. What are you going to ask, Michelle? Are these just ways of breaking it down so you know what it is? Yes. to know the different characteristics that go with uh, that specific nematode. <laughs> oh, now you've got me thinking about prostitutes. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, collapsed okay. butts. So, let me, what's the biggest one here? Not as good as it would be in person, but um, so here's your ova. And right here, you can't sell, tell so much in this picture, but let me, maybe I can pull one up online. These right here are the polar plugs. And then um, see how it's more barrel shaped. So instead of being a nice little oval, it has like the little ends on each side, just like a barrel does. Oh, okay. And see, so you can see the barrel shape real good on here too. And then your whips, this is how they look. So essentially, and the way I understand it, is this is the anterior, their little mouth part, and then this is the posterior, which is like their tail end. Okay. 
but see how they have like little whip like ends to them they're real thick and then it gets real thin and And let me see if I can find um, a better example of polar plugs. Okay, yeah, you can see it better here. Oops. how it looks like little plugs in it yeah see those plugs so those are the polar plugs and they're barrel shaped because um because they're not that perfect oval i think that's the wrong one sorry So that's our trickerous trickeria. Um, your main things for that one are going to be your barrel shape, um, your whip-like tail, and um, <clears throat> and your double wall. Then the next one's going to be our ascaris, and again, these are all still intestinal nematodes. Ascaris lumbricordis um, is the round worm. It is the largest adult intestinal nematode. Um, and then your, uh, your infective stage is going to be an embryonated ova because that's part of that ETA. Um, it also has a liver lung migration, which is specific for the Ascaris. Uh, the method of, of infection is to ingest the embryonated ova. Your diseases and symptoms are bowel obstruction, uh, distended abdomen. The most, it's the most common parasitic infection worldwide and the second most common helmet. What's the most common helmet? That endo. Enterobius, correct. Enterobius. Um, so, you know, in, you know, if you have a dog that has worms, it's got that fat little belly. Have y'all ever had a dog with worms or seen dogs with worms? Well, they have these like fat little bellies and that's one of the giveaways of whether or not like a puppy has worms. Um, well, those little kids that you see on some of those, um, those sad shows that they do about them not having like food or clean water and stuff like that. Yeah, um, that have little, are yeah so that can either be from like starvation or um, a lot of the time it's a distended abdomen from um, like parasites. So Ascaris lumbricordis is a big one for bowel obstruction and the distended abdomen. Um, your diagnosis is to identify ova in the stool. And then Ascaris lumbricoides is special because it has a couple different kinds of ova. It's got fertile ova and it's got unfertile ova. And then your fertile ova also has two different kinds and it can either be mammillated or decorticated. And I will show you the pictures um, for the different ones here shortly. So, Ascaris. Lemmercoides. Does anyone know what that one is? What type of worm? It uh, is actually um, it round worm. Yep, it's a round worm. So it doesn't always have a common name. When it is, it's a round worm, just like its broader classification of nematodes. So it's a round worm of the round worms. It is the largest adult intestinal nematode. And see, once it gets into, um, I know it likes to mention things like this, but once it gets into so much information, so like it's not just the largest adult nematode, it's the largest adult intestinal nematode. So I think they're a little less important when it gets like that, but the more important one um, would be that it is the, um, the second most, most common helmet. 
I kind of notice that going through they're like they're all little bitty and then this one's like 30 centimeter or 30 centimeters mm -hmm. yeah just wait till you get to cess codes and delay them you're like oh my gosh like literally you can only have like one in your body because um because it's too big and for any other um any other delatums or parasites to fit so some of these you're gonna be like Ooh. and when i had these lectures like my teacher finds it like quite wonderful pleasure in life to um to freak people out or to like bother them so she of course had to put a put a nice big picture of a prolapse rec rectum with worms coming out of it and um like some balls of like a lot of these little worms bunched up together and coming out oh my gosh it was awful even my whole trickery speech is way better than than the um, education i personally got on this so a scarce lumbricordy second most common helmet um it's gonna be your round worm your infective stage is what Em embryonated ova? Yep, embryonated ova. And then your method is going to be what? What has it been so far? How, how does something get to your intestine? Ingestion. 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 It can also be by penetration and traveling, but ingestion is going to be your big one for a lot of them. And we'll, I'll tell you when it changes. So, yep, your big one's going to be ingestion of an embryonated ova. Your diseases and symptoms. Are going to be bowel obstruction. Distended abdomen. And then your um, diagnosis. What is your going to be your major diagnosis for a lot of these? The unembryonated eggs. Yeah, this one's I think is just simply identify the ova in the stool. So that's the only difference there is between a lot of them is whether it's embryonated or unembryonated. But most of them are going to be identifying ova in the stool. With the exception of one, which one of these nematodes is your diagnosis different for? Uh, isn't one of them in the blood? Uh, well, you have other worms that are in the blood, but your your cesto or I'm sorry, your nematode specifically. Enterobius. Yeah, your enterobius vermicularis. You don't use a stool sample. You're not identifying ova in the stool. You're identifying ova from the cellophane tape prep. Now, um, I told you some of them have like more key characteristics than others. This is one of them. So you have both fertile or infertile ova. So your fertile ova um, can be either mammillated or decorticated. And then they will be round with a thick shell. Now, mammillated versus decorticated. So you've got mammillated. What does that look like? Do y'all remember? Oh, it's uneven? Yeah, it's the one that has the real uneven edges. I think of it of mammals are furry and the ova or the um, it's really the shell of the ova the ova looks furry and I'll show y'all like what I mean by that here shortly and then your other one is decorticated your decorticated is has a smooth um, shell on it and that one, I remember um, the decor, it's smooth like decor, like you know your house, de house decor and how you decorate things. 
You want it to look nice and smooth and pretty and put together. So then you have infertile ova or infertile. And these are all for Ascaris lumbricoides. So your infertile um, has an outer mammillated. Um, the outer shell is mammillated. And then the um, inner side of it, like the all of the inside, is has inner globular material. And then it's elongated. Elongated and has inner globular material. And I don't think... Um, like y'all's book has the whole describes it as inner globular material, but you will be able to like have to know from a picture. So I'll show you y'all the pictures. I also consider it um, more dark and messy. So the infertile ova. Dark and messy, but those aren't like super scientific terms. We're going to talk about our different kinds of um, ova for Ascaris. So what is out of decorticated or mammillated? Which one does this look like? Mammillated. Mammillated. So look, see how it looks kind of fuzzy? Fuzzy around the outside. So mammals are fuzzy and your mammillated is uneven. And then, so this is your decorticated. See how that shell has a nice, smooth outer lining? So that so nice. The, so the ASCARS has all three? Yes, it has fertile, which includes mammillated and decorticated, and then it has infertile, um, which, is, which is different, and this is your infertile egg. See how it looks dark, messy, has a mammillated outer, and all this inner globular material, whereas these have a differentiated like embryo. You can see the little embryo here. You can see the embryo on the, in the inner of this one. But then oh. your infertile doesn't have that separation. So even though your mammillated does have um, the mammillated outside and it has what looks like the inner globular material, but that's really the, um, the embryonated egg. And so there's still that fine separation, whereas this is just a smooth, dark, interglobular material blob. So if they both have a, a worm, what's the difference in the infertile and the fertile? Well, uh, I, there's, only, there's only a difference in the infertile and the fertile. Um, the infertile does not have a worm in it, and the fertile um, has the embryo that can grow the little larva in it. Um, okay. Now, the difference between decorticated and mammillated um, is not, there's not one. I looked it up, and I guess science hasn't figured out why some of them are decorticated and some are mammillated yet, but that's just two different options for what those eggs can look like. So, mammillated and decorticated are both fertile. And then your um, infertile is going to be this one. And then here's what some of the worms look like. Um, but again, for this one, it's not as key characteristics as the ova are. Our next one is going to be... I didn't go over my main points for that one. So Ascaris lumbricoides um, is your roundworm. It's the, um, oh, liver lung migration. I didn't put that on there. That is super important. So it has liver lung migration. And most of these stay in the intestinal tract. But Ascaris has liver lung 
migration. And what that means is that um, it needs to grow. Oh, what it needs to grow is to go through the liver and the lungs. Um, so it'll start in your intestines and then it migrates through your tissues. And then you, um, and then it, I think it gets in like your, your, you cough it up in the, in the lung mucus. Cause you know, if you like cough up stuff, junk, it's like phlegm. Well, it'll come up in that phlegm and then you swallow it back down into your intestines. So to complete its life cycle, it has to go through like the liver lung migration. And sometimes when it migrates, it ends up in places that like it's not supposed to be. But its goal is to go to the lungs and then get coughed up and then swallowed to get back into the intestine. And then it's also the um, uh, need for... So if you cough it up and spit it out, then it doesn't go into the intestines. Correct. But its goal is that you're going to cough it up and then swallow it. This is the one that was more important for it. I think it is the uh, most common parasitic infection worldwide. That one, actually, I'm going to take off the largest adult intestinal nematode and put in that it is the most common parasitic infection worldwide. So quick recap, which, um, what does a mammalated, is it fertile or infertile, first of all? If it's mammalated? Uh-huh. Mammalated, is it fertile or infertile? Uh, fertile? It's kind of a trick question. Yes, um, it's fertile, but it, the infertile ova also has that mammalated outer shell, um, but it just, if it's infertile, it doesn't have the, uh, the embryo in it. It's just that solid globular, interglobular material. Um, and then if it's fertile, it can either be mammalated or decorticated. And the mammalated will have the embryo in it that's not like this solid mess of mesh. And um, your decorticated is fertile and has a smooth outer shell. And then I wanted to make one last point for this liver lung migration to remember which one um, makes this migration. If you look at ask. Ascaris, or Ascaris lumbricoides. So that's, see how it says scar in it? Then um, you can think about that migration is going to scar the patient. Because if you have the worm traveling through your body, that's going to, it sounds like it would meet scars, right? So for me, that was the easy way to remember which one did the liver lung migration. Can you go back? I should be. Okay, so our next one's going to be our hookworms. So there's two different kinds of hookworms. You've got your um, Ankylosoma duodenale and your Nicator americanus. Um, so one's an old world hookworm, which is the Ankylosoma duodenale, and then your new world hookworm is your Nicator americanus. 
um, your infective stage is what's called a filariform larva. And I'll go over the different kinds of larva forms here in, um, when we go over it. Um, your uh, method of infection. So we talked about our ETAs, right? So our anaerobius, our ascaris, and the um, trichuris. They all um, have an infective, or I'm sorry, an, an infection that is going to be from an embryonated ova and from ingesting that ova. Well, it's getting, it gets a little different with the hookworms. Um, theirs is caused by the filariform larva um, that will actually penetrate the skin, um, which is usually through your feet or outer. Uh, outer um, like hands and arms and legs because if you're standing on the ground what's what source is it going to have to to and to penetrate your skin it's going to be it'll be like that um, your symptoms is going to be ground itch at the penetration site um, anemia cutaneous um, migrants it's uh, larval migrants cutaneous larval migrants um, which would be part of like the dog and cat hookworms and then to di your diagnosis is going to be to identify the ova in the stool. And your key characteristics, we'll talk about the ova, the rhabditiform larva, and the filariform larva. So your rhabditiform larva is like your younger growing uh, stage, your eating, your feeding and growth stage. And your filariform larva is usually your infective stage. So it's going to be your. So, uh -huh. What does it mean by old and new? Uh, they just have two different kinds of hookworms. Um, your ankylostoma is going to be your old world. Hookworm. And then your other one's going to be Nicator Americanus. And that's going to be your new world. And they have a few differences in the adult worm, um, but it, their ova, I believe, are indistinguishable. So these are going to be hookworms. Um, I remember your ankylosoma. So ankylosoma sounds like, um, to me, it sounds like that one of those old dinosaurs. I think there's one that has like a really similar name, but it sounds to me like some dinosaur name. And so your ankylostoma is, sounds like a dinosaur, which is from your old world. And then for your Nicator Americanus, there's a couple different things. So one is America is the new world. You know, how they always refer to the Americas as the new world, especially in history books and such things like that. So Americanus as a new world and your other option is um, the N start together. So the N from Nicator Is the same is um, matches your in for new. Okay. So that's a couple different ways. Um, the wonderful thing with uh, with these is that if you can remember one, you can automatically differentiate the other. So if you're like, nope, does not sound like a dinosaur to me, does not sound like old world to me you can say okay but this American in it that that I get and then you can just know the other ones by default so they're hookworms and to remember that they are hookworms remember they have to have a way to hook on right so they have teeth like structures We'll talk a little bit more about that here soon. 
but to remember that these are the ones with that are hookworms is to hook onto something you have to have something to grab on so they have teeth like structures is it the difference on these is that one has the the teeth all like on the end and the other one has it on the body cavity yes there's different yeah uh, uh, the way they have their teeth is different and then um the plates, the, like the plates they have. One has two sets of plates and one has two pairs of feet. And I'll show you a little better here. And the old old world one looks way scarier. And I forgot a little note for her. For Nicator Americanus, um, you can also remember that um, it hooks you like, so it has Nicator, which reminds me of Nectar. So it hooks you like nectar. You know how good nectar is? It's all sweet and really yummy. And so the nicator sounds to me like nectar, and it hooks you like nectar for your hookworm. So you can relate your hooks, hookworm with your nicator americanus. When you get ready to tap those for me, I'll show you. Which one? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking to my mom. Sorry. Oh, okay. I, I wasn't sure. And I was like, well, I don't want to. No. Oh, 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 sorry. I've got, I got two things going You're on. You're okay. At once. I just wanted to make sure. I thought so. And then I was like, ah, no, nope, I'm not going to just ignore her and be like, no. <laughs> okay. So now we'll get into our infection. It's going to be from what? The other ones were from embryonated ova but this one's gonna be different. So hookworms, what does that sound like? If you get hooked, that's gonna be your penetration one, but it's gonna be by a filariform larva. Now, the way I remember this one, let me go over the filariform versus the, um, oh, I told you a little bit. So your rhabditiform is going to be your feeding or growth stage and your filariform is going to be your infective stage. So it's like a little baby larva, a little baby baby, and then it's like a teenage worm. So remember your baby baby is cute and they just like to eat and they don't do anything that bad. And then you get a teenager and they're infective and awful and can kill people. And I mean, that, that was excessive, but you know what I mean? So what stage did you call this? This one's gonna be your filariform larva. Okay. Filariform. I remember that larva with a flare does more damage. And this can go either way. It can either be larva with a flare, like, you know, some people are super flamboyant and have a lot of flair to their personalities. Um, they're more out there. Or it can be like your, your um, you know, like the flares with the fire. So larva with a flare does more damage in comparison to your rhabditiform, um, which sounds like rabbi that's more reserved and conservative. So your infection is going to be um, filariform larva. Um, and then the method is going to be from skin penetration by that filariform larva. Larva with a flare does more damage. So that's going to be your infective stage. Um, your hookworm is going to be one of those that penetrates in, in, instead of being ingested. And that's why it needs its hooks. Uh, your symptoms and diagnosis uh, is ground itch. Now there's one other one that also has ground itch as a symptom. And they have a lot of, uh, of similarities. So um, a hard thing to do is differentiating strong galoides and, um, compared to hookworms. And so hook, your strong galoides is the, is the other one that has ground itch as a symptom. And then anemia. You can, if you can't remember which one causes anemia, well, the one that decides to uh, penetrate your skin. And then it's got um, your cutaneous larval migraines. 
And um, that's more pertinent to like dog and cat hookworms. And the diff there's, uh, you'll see two different terms. One's larval curran, and that's external autoinfection from strongyloides compared to the larva migrans is internal traveling, like in a hookworm. So that larva migrans is, um, and I think there's, like we talked about the liver lung migration. Um, I want to say that the hookworms is like to the heart. But more importantly, it goes in and travels. And then your diagnosis is going to be identify OVA in the stool. And then we talked about a few different forms. So our OVA is our egg. And that one's going to be have a multi-segmented embryo. And that's really characteristic of your hookworms. A multi-segmented embryo. It's oval. Has a thin, smooth outer shell. And then our rhabdidiform larva. has a long buccal cavity or buccal cavity, which is like the mouth. So to remember rhabdidiform first, you need to know that that rhabdidiform is the feeding or growth stage. And I remember it like rabbi. You, do y'all know what a rabbi is? Yeah. Okay. So like your rabbi is going to be um, more conservative and reserved. And so it's just the um, that's hard. And so these larvae would be like the so like the baby baby larva just eat just eats all day. And then your filariform. Specifically for um, for your hookworms, <clears throat> is going to have a pointed tail. This is going to be differential between strongyloides as well. So your filariform larva has a pointed tail, and then you need to know um, what that means. So filariform is going to be your infective stage. So it's going to be like your teenage, teenage baby. So the word rapiform means like baby, and then filiform means teenager kind of stage? Yeah. Like that's how you can associate that growth stage for them. Um, they're both going to be larva, which is, um, which is like a younger worm. But it's going to start out in a feeding or growth stage, which is your rhabditiform, and then it grows into your filariform stage, which is the infective stage, which does damage to humans. Okay. So your filariform is your infective stage. It's kind of like your teenage baby. It does more damage. Um, and to remember that um, is the larva with a flare. It does more damage. Now, on, on these two, what's different also about these two, I think one of them, I can't remember, but one of them has a more projected tail than the other. Yep, the um, pointed tail in the filariform 
stage is going to be different uh, differentiating um, factor between strong galoides and the hookworms. And we'll go over that by itself too. So I think it's picture time. Let me make sure. Well, I mean between the old and the new world worm. Oops, I lost it. You have two different kinds of teeth on each of those worms. Oh, yeah, it's the difference between the, the infective stage and the uh, rhabditiform stage. Okay. But it's not differential between the adult. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can tell with that pointed tail if it's the uh, rhabditiform or if it's the phalariform, but you can't necessarily tell that it's the um, between the ankylostoma or nicator. They're pretty, uh, look the same. Okay, I think I covered all that. So let me show you all the pictures. Okay, so here's your ova. So see how they have multi-segmented embryos? Let me, you can't tell it super well. Can you tell that there's different little circles in there? Yeah. So it's multi-segmented um, embryo. Let me see if I can find one. It's a better picture. That's a little better. See how there's an embryo, an embryo, an embryo, an embryo. See how it looks kind of like a bunch of little grapes on top of each other? Yeah. So they have multi-segmented embryos. Let's see if I can look into a better one. that make you so excited? Look at that. Could you just imagine having that in your body? Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, and then if you're looking at picture-wise, you can remember that the old world is the scary looking one, because you know all those things in like the old world are look way scarier than they do now, like your prehistoric animals and dinosaurs and stuff like that. And so your old world hookworm has the two sets of teeth like specific teeth. So that's the ones that have the like the little teeth coming down. Right. And then your, um, your new world is the one that has plates instead of your teeth. And so it has two sets of plates instead of scary looking teeth. Let me see if I can find a better picture of the plates. Here you go. Yeah, this is much better. So you can see the difference. So did you see those scary teeth last time? The scary looking little teeth? Mm -hmm. So those were the, um, the ankylostomas, the old world, and then this is the plates of the new world, Nicator americanus. So see here, you can see plates on it. They have two sets of plates, whereas your ankylostoma has these teeth. Ooh, yeah, that does look scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> yeah, so if you can't ever remember which one has cutting plates versus cutting teeth, old world always is going to look scarier. Um, yeah, and then which ones have teeth? It's going to be your hookworms because they got to hook on to you. Um, and then it's important to know the difference in the um, rhabditiform and your phalariform larva. So your, where we go, here's our rhabditiform one. It's going to have the long buccal cavity or like a little mouth. And I'll try to find that one online too because the mouth goes to about here. 
and I'll see if I can't find a more clear version. And then your um, Phalariform is going to have the pointed tail. And remember, your one that does more damage is going to be your pointy, is your little pointy hooked one. So it'd be your Phalariform would do more damage in that stage. Yep, and that's your pointed tail. So your, your rabbi is conservative and reserved. That's your feeding and growth stage. Your phalariform is your infective stage. That's the one that has a pointed tail. Oh, and you, uh, it's easy to remember the rabdidiform too because that's your feeding stage and it's got the long buccal cavity. So he needs a big mouth um, because he is just there to eat things. And then your, um, your infective stage is the one with the pointed tail and it doesn't need the buccal cavity. And then I told you all there's a lot of similarities between um, hookworms and another species, which is going to be Strongyloides, Stercoralis, or Stercoralis. And we're still talking about intestinal nematodes, which are specifically roundworms that are under the helminth worm category. So, so we're strong still under the hematose. Worms. Yep, we're still doing not? nematodes, we're still doing helminths, and we're these are actually still intestinal nematodes specifically and not tissue nematodes. Um, so strongyloides is the common they're, name. They're specifically what now? Huh? What did you uh, say? Intestinal, intestinal nematodes. Instead of? Tissue nematodes. Oh, these are tissue that we're getting into. No, 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 these are still intestinal. Okay. And I'll tell you when we get to the tissue ones. Okay. Uh, so strongyloides is a threadworm. Its infective stage is the phalariform larva. And the method is the phalariform larva penetrate the skin. So your strongyloides and your hookworms, your strong and your hooks, um, both penetrate the skin. Um, it's got a... Uh, characteristic history of auto reinfection. So it doesn't need to go out and do the whole life cycle again to reinfect you. It just like auto reinfects in your body. It can do its whole life cycle within your body. So what does it mean by thread? Is it because it's flat and it looks like a... I, I think it's just kind of skinny and stuff and they're like, oh, oh. I'm gonna call this a thread worm. Okay. I don't know, why does anyone <laughs> come up with the names they come up with? <laughs> But I guess that's what you get when you find these things. So yeah. most of these that we're going into right now, um, they're going to have a, 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 a rab form and a fill form, right? Yes. Okay. Or at least your hookworm and strong aloides does. So your hookworm and your strong and your strong aloides are the ones that have your rabdidiform and phalariform that are um, that are relevant to uh, lab techs, and they they have a lot of similarities. So um, we're going to go over afterward differentiating strongyloides um, and hookworms. And so if you can't remember which ones are penetrators, um, and if you can't remember which one has these two forms of larva, um, then try to remember it's the ones that are compared together to try to differentiate. Then your diseases are in symptoms are ground itch, just like hookworm, um, pneumonitis, fatal hyperinfection, and um, larva currents. And um, I said earlier, I'll repeat that though. The larva currents is an external auto infection. And your method of diagnosis is um, to identify the rabidiform larva in the stool. So. Oh. I have a question real quick. Is it important to know the lifespan of these? Yes. No, not the lifespan. I'm sorry. The life cycle. Yes. The lifespan. Not so much. Okay. It don't really matter. Because you can end that lifespan real quick, right? If you kill it or expel it or something like that. So it's mostly, oh, but um, 
my teacher was super fond of telling us how many eggs they can produce in a single day though and some of them are super super crazy like crazy crazy numbers thousands one was like a million it could produce a million eggs a day i think it was one of the steps toads but it's not uncommon for these things to be able to produce like 20,000 eggs a day. So most of these that we're going into right here are more daytime. Um, I mean, they're, they're in there 24 seven. Um, I have a little moon next to which area cause it's more, uh, it's more oh, okay. Uh, okay. <clears throat> nocturnal specifically for that one, but I wouldn't differentiate any of these ones we've gone okay. over as like a day or nighttime with the one exception of Enerobius vermicularis that will go and lay, uh, the gravid female goes and lays her eggs at night. The day and night time um, for the study questions was in the tissue ones. Yeah, okay. okay yeah. I've got I, just, I just remember the day and night. <laughs> I stayed up late doing those. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll definitely go over those. Um, and so your strongyloides, uh, you didn't identify a rhabditiform larva in the stool. Um, and then your little rhabditiform has a short buccal cavity um, and a genital primordium. And then your phalariform has a notched tail and no buccal cavity with a long esophagus. Strongyloides. Breadworm. Do you ever get tired of Word not knowing what you're typing? And then I sit there and second guess on myself all the time, and I'm like, no, that's right. It just doesn't know it yet. So your strong aloides, caracalis, is your threadworm. Move these over. It is one, um, it's special because it can be free living. meaning it needs no hopes. <clears throat> to remember that, I always um, think of a strong thread. It can be three living, so it has to be strong be able to be free living so strong lady i like how my micro professor said to remember it it's a strong independent woman that don't need no man <laughs> <laughs> i love that that's a good example strong okay, strong loyalties strong independent woman don't need no man <laughs> I love it. There's a strong, independent woman that don't need no man. I don't think I'm going to put worm instead of woman. Infective stage is going to be your witch form. The philophilic. I can't say that. Filiform larva. Filariform. Filariform. Filariform larva. Method that filariform larva penetrates the skin. And which one else penetrates the skin? 
the hook worm? Yes. So, you've got your hook worm. And your strong galoidy. Penetrate skin. So it has a way of, um, of auto reinfecting as well. So auto reinfection. So this is a, this is like a hookworm. Uh, they have a lot of similarities to the hookworm, but strongloides is the threadworm. But they do this auto reinfection <laughs> where the rhabditiform larva turns into malariform larva in the intestine. to reinfect the host. But if you can just remember that it does the, is one of those that can auto reinfect the host, then um, I don't think you need to know well, how it does it. So I don't understand that. What do you, I know what auto, I mean, I know what reinfect infection means, but it, it just it doesn't have to leave your body and then go get embryonated and then you have to accidentally swallow it again it it like does it all within your body it goes through its whole life cycle and then can reproduce and do everything within your body so it can make more what so if you have one of these in your body it can make more of them it can uh -huh. keep multiplying more and more and more and more Yes, without having to go through the whole route of transmission and um, and hosts and stuff like that again. It can just keep doing it within your body. Okay. So it also, uh, uh, for your diseases and symptoms, It's also associated with brown itch, um, like the hookworms, and that's like at the site of penetration. Pneumonitis in the lungs, um, a fatal hyperreaction. Um, and what that is talking about is um, sometimes your body has like a stronger reaction to them um, like, you know, some people can die from these things and some people aren't so bad. It's kind of like that. So someone's body can have a fatal hyper reaction that ends in anaphylactic shock. Kind of like an allergic reaction. Yes. And then it also has larva currents, which just means larval migration. And if you think about which ones have the larva current, um, think about how they get there. If you swallow something and it goes to your intestine, you get it there. But if it, you know, enters your foot and needs to get to your intestines, then, well, it's got to find a way to get there, right? So it's got to have that migration. So if it's got to, if it goes through the skin like your foot, it can't really be a, a larva. It has to be an adult, doesn't it? To have the teeth or be able to, I mean. It's your filariform, your filariform larva. Like a teenager, it can't be a rabbi. Nope, can't be the, it can't be the rabbi. It has to be a filariform larva. Right, right. It's gotta yep. have some form of getting in there where if it's in a shell, it can't. Correct. Okay. So then your diagnosis is going to be to identify the rhabditiform larva in the stool. And 
and then some of your key characteristics, your rhabditiform, rhabditiform. And which stage is that, the rhabditiform stage? That's like the baby stage. Yep. It eats all the time. eats all the time. So it's got a short um, buccal cavity and a um, prominent genital primordium. Prim Primoridum, primordium. Yeah, I think that's the way to say it. And before you ask, I do not know what we're about to find out. Genital um, primordium is uh, the genital swellings from the labia majora in female fetuses and fused to form the scrotum in male fetuses. Um, the genital tubercle becomes the clitoris in female fetuses and the penis in male fetus fetuses. So it's the genital swelling that forms the labia or um, the scrotum. And it shows it in the pictures. I have a hard time seeing um, what exactly they're referring to in some of them. Um, this one, I can see like the little swelling there a little bit. And this one, you can kind of see the swelling, um, but it's kind of hard for me personally to, um, I don't think I would ever look at the microscope and be like, oh, genital primo uh, primodium. <laughs> But if you can, all the power to you, it'll just make you a more awesome tech. See this one, you can see it a little bit, how that little swelling there. Oh, and here's that buccal canal that you can see a little better than you could um, in the picture I was trying to hold up. So it's from like there to there. Okay, so the rhabditiform has a short bu um, buccal cavity and a genital primordium. And then your phalariform, which is the, which stage is it? Uh, your teenage stage. Uh-huh, which is, what does it do? Huh? Scientifically, what does it do? It's the infective it's stage. Yep, that one's going to be your teenage stage or your infective stage. So your phalariform um, happens to have a notched tail and no buccal cavity. And then it also has a long esophagus. Trace the skin. Uh, yep, nope, I got the diagnosis. Oh, a cool fact. I don't think you'll be tested on it, but a cool fact about strongyloides, and it just kind of goes with long with it's like, it's a strong, independent woman that don't need no man. Like, she literally does not need no man because the females, the males cannot, but any female strongyloides larva can, in an all-female environment, can change themselves into, uh, it's called parthogenesis, um, which is like self-fertilization. So, like, strongyloides legit does not need no man because she can fertilize her own self in an all-female world. Isn't that crazy? That is. Yeah, and it's called parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis. I think this one's going to be a lot easier to remember just because of the word strong in front of it. And then you yes, put the woman behind it. it. <laughs> yeah, it's got all these relations to strong things. I know. Okay, so first I'm going to go over the picture specifically for strong loides, and then I'll do a little section on differentiating your strong loides from which one? 
Oh, uh, you just said it while ago. Because it ha also has the ground itch. Uh huh. Yep. I can't so remember. Yeah. <laughs> That's why all nighters are bad for you. Well, I know, but I had to get those study questions, <laughs> those study yep. questions in. I need all the extra points I can get. Like you can get hookworms. It's going to be strong loins from hookworms. Yep. So here's some of our pictures. Here is the notch pale, and is that on the filariform or rhabdidiform? The right notch. Now? The notch uh, is going to be your filariform. Or filariform. Sorry, I can't say it right. Uh huh. And it's going to have no buccal cavity, but it's going to have a long esophagus in the filariform. And now for your rhabditiform, it's got this little buccal cavity here. Can you kind of see that little indent right in the middle? Right there. That's the little buccal cavity. Uh huh. And then your um, your rhabditiform also has the uh, your genital primordium, prim primordium. I'm not quite positive. <coughs> so strong is the thread worm. It's a strong thread worm. Um, it's strong, so it has its increased genitals, and then it's got its auto reinfection and ground itch. Mm. And then. This one I will show you, I'll actually keep it on the screen to show you so you can look at the pictures too. So differentiating strongyloides and your hookworms. So your hookworms are Nicator americanus and then the Ankylostoma duodenal. So you have to be able to um, differentiate these. And so this what is the- What are we differentiating here? Your hookworms from your strongyloides. Your two hookworm species from strongyloides. Now, and, when we pull this back up later, will we be able to see this? You should. I'll be really upset if you can't. But you should. Um, so this is the rhabditiform stage. And then this is the filariform stage. So for the rhabditiform stage, the hookworm has a long um, buccal cavity. Can't really see. The hookworm's in yellow. And then your um, your strongyloides is in orange, so it's got a long. I wonder if I can't pull this up online. Yeah, because I feel like that would be hugely important. Yep, there they are. That sure made it easy, didn't it? Maybe. Lost it. There we go. Okay. So, um, your strong, or your, um, I'll do the hookworm first. So here's your hookworm. And your hookworm has a, um, a long buccal cavity. Oh, I'm on the filariform. Here we go. Here's your rhabditiform stage. Your hookworm has a long buccal cavity. And then um, your strongyloides has a short buccal cavity, but it has the prominent genital prim uh, primordium. And then in your filariform stage or infective stage, um, your hookworm, here's your hookworm. So remember which one sound, which one looks like a hook. If that one has a notch tail and this one has a sharp pointy tail, which one actually resembles a hook? Wouldn't it be the hookworm? Because it's mm -hmm. sharp. Yeah, so your hookworm has the pointy tail, just like Captain Hook has his like little pointy hand. It has the, the tail that points at the end. And then um, and then it also at the filariform stage has the short esophagus. So here is its esophagus. And then your strongyloides is strong and has a long esophagus. It's also your threadworm. So it's got the long esophagus. 
that can kind of remind you of a thread. And then um, your strong Lilies has a notched tail, has a notched tail in the filariform, form. Um, and it looks like a, um, find it. I, can't, I showed you in the other picture, but let me pull it up again. So on the rabbi? This was on the, um, on the filariform. So filariform, the strongaloides has a notched tail, so it's uh -huh. not pointy. It's got a little notch in it, and it's, it looks like a thread compared to your, um, your hookworm, where did he go, who has a pointy tail. So like on the rabbi tail. part, I can't tell a difference. Let me pull that one up again. except for one's curvage is a little different. Yeah, and you can't really go off that because that can change any time really. Um, yeah, it's just hard. So here, see the buccal cavity here is just a little longer than this like okay. little short buccal cavity. Um, but I'm sure for like something like that, she'll go off of uh, the words, like the, the physical description, ver like a uh, written description and not like a picture. Okay but you do need to know which one has which characteristic. Now our next one is going to where do you go? It's going to be our um, Trinchinella spiralis. So don't get that one confused with Trichuris trichuria. This is Trinchinella spiralis. The common name. Um, it doesn't really have a common name. Um, the infective stage is the insisted larva. Um, the method of infection is ingestion of undercooked meat with the insisted larva in the muscle. Um, the diseases is inflammation and pain in a localized area. The method of diagnosis is a muscle biopsy or ELISA um, or serologic testing. And then your key identification at characteristics, this one looks different than all the rest because it's in the muscles. And so your key um, characteristics are is the larva is coiled larva insisted in the muscle um, tissue, especially striated muscle, and that's actually called nurse cells. Let me show you. These are all called nurse shells, nurse cells. These are called what now? Nurse cells, like the nurse that um, that works on you at the hospital. Nurse cells. Right here. And what about the nurse cells? That's what they call the coiled larva insisted in the muscle tissue. And keep in mind, we're still doing um, nematodes, and um, which are a subgroup of helminths. Subgroup of what? Helminths. Yes. Okay. I know, I have a hard time with that word. Trinchinella spiralis. And it doesn't have a common name, but what I'm going to put here instead is accidental and zoonotic. Um, do y'all generally use zoonosis or zoonotic when that term comes up? What now? So the disease state is like zoonosis, um, but when y'all do it, you usually say zoonotic or zoonosis. 
Okay. Do you, like do y'all? Is there one that y'all seem to hear more than another? But the zoonosis. I've seen it back and forth a little bit. I think zoonosis. Uh, zoonosis is proper. So, um, a <clears throat> trichinellus viralis is um, it's a trick. It is not supposed to be. Um, humans are not supposed to be its infective host. It's a trick, like hypnosis. Um, for those spirals, you know how like the little hypnosis thingy that they always do in the movies is those little spir black and white spirals. That's what I think of. Those ones. And they start making it go in a circle and it's like you're getting dizzy and they're trying to hypnotize you. Right. That's um, that's what I think of for this one and how to remember it. Is it on the doc? Can you all see the document or online right now? What? Are you are y'all looking at the word document or the internet? The word document. Okay. So trichinellus viralis, um, accidental or zoonosis, it's a trick. It's actually supposed to be in um, another uh, host. And then it's like hypno hypnosis with those little spirals. And um, since it's tricking you, you need a nurse. Actually, you know, I usually put these at the end and there's a good reason for it. that one at the end after we go over everything and I think it kind of helps. Um, so it's accidental or zoonosis. It's really supposed to be um, in uh, carnivorous animals, pigs, bears. Um, it's generally pigs that infect us because uh, we don't usually go and eat bear. So the definitive post is carnivorous animals. So this wouldn't be like in cows and stuff? No, um, it'll be like, and by pigs, I mean like wild pigs, like boar and, um, and bears. But again, we don't usually go and eat bears. But we do go and eat, eat pigs and eat boars, and that's when we get it. So the infective stage is going to be your insisted larva. It requires one intermediate host. What's an intermediate host? Remember we talked about that, what, like an hour or two ago? So now, now no one remembers it. We've slipped since then. So your types of hosts, your intermediate host is going to be, is harbors a parasite during larval or asexual stage. So let's say this, um, this um, pig or whatnot is hosting it. And then what happens is it goes and gets eaten by a bear. And a bear would be like your definitive host or another animal has it insisted in its, um, in its muscle. And then the carnivorous boar will come and eat it. And, um, and then it'll be insisted in the boar. And so the one intermediate host is going to be those carnivorous animals. Or I'm sorry, it's going to be the animals before it gets to the carnivorous animals. And then your method is going to be ingestion of undercooked. After this class, y'all will never have rare anything ever again. <laughs> no. Ingestion of undercooked meat <coughs> with I thought I love sushi. I know, sushi's so good though. With insisted larvae in the muscle. 
and then your diseases or symptoms. is going to be your inflammation and pain at the localized area. Um, now don't get that one confused with like ground itch, but this is due to the area where the muscle is has been um, invaded and not the way it was supposed to be. So it's getting inflamed and irritated. Your body's like, wait, this isn't supposed to be here. And then your diagnosis is going to be a muscle biopsy or um, serological testing, like ELISA. Your key characteristics um, is going to be your larva. Um, and they will be coiled. First of all, they're going to be nurse cells. So they're called nurse cells, which are coiled larvae and cysted in muscle tissue, specific, especially striated, striated muscle. But again, I don't think that you'll get test questions like that. So it's a trick. Um, it's hypnos hypnosis like magic. It, you need a nurse. Um, your one intermediate host is going to be like a pig. So it's a trick. Like hypnosis, you're going to need a nurse. It's an accidental or zoonotic infection, a zoonosis, um, from eating undercooked pig or bear. And our pictures. Uh, remember the testing for this diagnostics is a little different too. Um, since this is your, it's in the muscle, you'll be doing a muscle biopsy. And so here's your pictures. They're pretty, um, you know what they are when you see them. Like it won't be hard to confuse these with your other nematodes. See the larva all curled up? Yeah. Okay, and then we're getting um, We've just got, uh, we'll have this one and then our tissue nematodes. First. Draconculus medinesis, benenensis is going to be the guinea worm. Um, the infective stage is the larva molts twice in the copepod, um, turning into an L3 larva. And then you drink the water with infected copepods in it. And then there's no drugs to treat it. You must remove by slowly pulling out of the blister. Did she show you the picture of the leg with the, like the little pencil that has a worm wrapped around it? We haven't had class yet. Oh, for, for nematodes? No, we missed our class. So this test is basically just all of us learning it on our own, kind of. Oh, OK. Cool. I'll show you. It's the most disgusting thing ever. It will stick with you forever. And y'all will always remember me as the one that showed you this lovely picture. OK, so here's one. Here's a worm coming out of that with a little match stick. Here's another one. See how they're pulling it out of the foot? Oh, uh, we can't see it. Oh. We're still on the 
What a shame. Y'all are missing out on yeah, I know, I know. I'm just sitting here. Going. You're like, wait, I'm not even, <laughs> y'all aren't even going to tell me this time. <laughs> okay, so see that little worm on the matchstick? Yeah. And you have to slowly do that sometimes you can over only do a day it. or so because it'll break off, won't it? Yes. And you can only do it like inch by inch, a few inches at a time. Otherwise, it can break. And so I always thought that if it broke, it just goes back into the skin and you might not be able to find it again. But um, what I learned recently is actually it can cause a, um, a reaction. The, okay, so when you, break that, uh, when you break that worm, it releases these toxins that, uh, that can cause like necrosis and damage to that area. So it's more than just breaking it and losing it. It can cause like a severe reaction. Yeah. This is the one Jimmy Carter has like done a lot to try to eliminate. Really? Like his foundation has like put in a ton. Of, like the book just says like other foundations, but like it's um, Jimmy Carter's thing. Oh, cool. That's really neat. It needs to be because that's nasty. I, like if it was me, you can just cut it off. You can cut off my foot. It doesn't, I don't need it that bad. Um, <laughs> because I do not want to sit there for three days and watch them pull this worm out like inch, few inches at a time and just you no know, have to stare at it on a freaking pencil or a matchstick. Like, gosh, I want to do, I want to do travel tech, like for kind of like the doctors do without bo doctors without borders later on. But some of these I am like, Man, I don't know if I can handle it. So, yeah, but even if it breaks off, you know, let's say if it breaks off, can it, uh, can it like, I don't know, doesn't it like multiply or? Well, I think it'll go back to his life cycle. But like, like I said, I used to think that it, it the, uh, the problem was that once you broke it, you couldn't, it wasn't always easy to get it back. Um, but really, um, it has, once you break that worm, it releases toxins that are harmful and can cause severe secondary infection or anaphylaxis. Then there's no drug to treat it, so you must remove by slowly pulling out of the blister a few inches at a time. Um, diagnosis. Oh, all and one thing you got to do to diagnosis is observe the skin blister with an adult female worm. Um, emerging out of it. Um, it emerges about one year after infection. So this worm stays in the host for about a year before like exiting the host and that's when you will see it and it'll be a blister with the worm coming out. You have to wrap it around like a pencil or a stick. I'm sure there are more scientific things in first world countries but it's bigger in countries that don't always have that kind of access to great medical care. Um, you don't want to break that worm. And luckily it has a nice name that you can remember kind of easy too, like Dracula. Yeah. Like some Dracula things to do. So Draculopolis medinensis. And that's your guinea worm. This is one of those that, you know how some of mine are like really good ways to remember things and some of them are a bit of a stretch. This is one that's a bit of a stretch. But the best way I could come up with is um, the like the skin blisters and um, the Guinea, New Guinea, it's like really sunny there. Or I think of New Guinea as really sunny. And so Dracula. get skin blisters from the sun. Oh. <laughs> so Dracula is the Draculopolis. Get skin blisters. <laughs> This is diagnostic from the sun. We're sunny in New Guinea.
your infection, I'm sorry, your, um, your infective stage is going to be, um, and I don't think y'all need to know which one, but what happens is the larva molts twice in a copepod and becomes an L3 larva. So I think you can simply know that it's larva. Method, what, do y'all remember the method? Ingestion. Uh-huh, what do you ingest? Drink, from drinking uh -huh. contaminated water. Drinking contaminated water, what is it contaminated with? Parasites, because it's not filtered. It's there's not, one, no, it's not dough. There's it's an not. intermediate host that's really important. Uh huh. There's an intermediate host that's an important aspect of this. A copepod? Yes. So you drink water infected with copepod. Well, you drink water infected with infected copepod. What's a copa? What's a copepod? It's like a little, like kind of shellfish, I think. I'll show you. There's a general picture that they always use for copepods, and I'll make sure you see that. There's one intermediate host, which is a copepod. Would be that be like. Cruise ships, I've noticed when they cook, they get little fish. Are those little no, rods? No, 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 no. More like uh, kind of microscopic. Okay. Majorly microscopic. Like plankton. Yeah. They look like cockroaches with... I think they're more like the cockroaches of the water. But they feed a lot of things. Yeah, it looks like a cockroach with those long little... Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So that's what <coughs> I think they remember resemble like shrimp and stuff too, or related. But I could be like, wrong. Like what? I related. think they re they're related to shrimp, but I could be wrong on that. So your one intermediate host is a couple pod. Diseases and symptoms. Is very characteristic for the Dracunculus um, metamnesis. So your diseases and symptoms, there's no drug to treat. You must remove the slowly pulling of a skin blister a few inches at a time. Until removed. And take days. If broken, one can release toxin. cause damage to the site and potential anaphylaxis. Mm. And also um, secondary infections. So potential and potential what? Potential secondary infection. So like another infection because that skin's open and dead and exposed. Kind of like how, uh, oh, what do you call that spider that bites you and it kills the skin? Mm, yes, like uh, like uh, the brown recluse. Yeah. So once it bites you, not only kills the skin, but it has to be completely cut out because that skin can't recover from the damage of the Yeah, poison. until it's removed. 
The only reason why I know that is my dad's dog got bit with that. They had to cut that whole little area of skin yeah, out. Yeah, and you have to get ahead of it because if you don't fully get ahead of it, then um, then it'll just keep growing. The ne necrotic tissue will spread. So another fun fact about this thing that you have to pull out a few inches at a time. It can be four feet long. Mm. Holy cow. Yeah, so <laughs> don't sign me up for this one. So that's why it could take months to get rid of it. Or, or you days. have to slowly cool it. So if it's four feet long, that's why it takes so long. Yes, days. Let's see, uh, two inches into, um, it's 12 inches in a foot. And so if you can do two inches at a time, um, you can do that, what, you'll have to have at least six sessions. Wow. So what and do you do? The general. So what do you do in between sessions? Do they just tape the they roll part move. on the stick to the foot? Yep. Yeah, because they can't move, and if they break that, then then they're in trouble. They could die. Oh God. And these aren't places where you have a nice uh, bed to sit in at the hospital and prop your feet up and watch TV and get food brought to you, like. A lot of these places are third world countries that don't have really good medical access. Like half those pictures you saw are people that did it themselves like out in the sticks. Oh my gosh. Um, and then your, uh, your other diseases and symptoms are redness, pain, itching, nausea, and vomiting. So once you remove that, does it die or do you? Yes. Y'all remember which one, uh, which one won't die is that can be free living. Um, it's free living. Yep. Strong uh, strong lotus. Yep, strong lotus. So it doesn't. So if you were to remove it, it could live unless you kill it. Yes. Okay, now we're getting into our tissue or microfilariae nematodes. So they're still nematodes. They're still hel helminths, but these are going to be tissue uh, or microfilariae nematodes instead of your like intestinal ones. There's two, there's Lucharia um, bancrofti and then there's Loa Loa um, and they're differentiated by the tissues that they infect. So, and then also by like one's nocturnal and one's more prevalent during the day. Your Lucharia bancrofti um, <clears throat> does not have a common name and the um, Infective stage is the microfilariae in the blood or the adult wor worm in the lymph system. So the method of infection is to identify the microfilariae in the blood or the adult worm in the lymphatic system. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I switched those. Uh, your method of infection is the filariform larva enters the blood through the mosquito bite, which is its intermediate host. And then um, your disease or symptoms is elephantiasis because it clogs the lymphatic system. And then your method of diagnosis is to identify the microfilariae in the blood or the adult worm in the lymphatic system. So that's why I have my little elephant drawn here for the elephantiasis. And then um, nocturnal because it's more prevalent at night. So your collection should be um, collected between 9 p.m. and 3 o'clock in the morning. And that's why it's the time is prevalent to you as a lab tech. The specimen should be collected at a certain time. Um, do you all know what elephantiasis is? It's where your leg uh, swells up and looks like an elephant leg. Yep. <coughs> that is a picture that's usually shown for it. Oh, 
Holy cow. And that is from the lymph, um, the lymph area swelling. Mm. And you all go through the river of blindness and stuff too, don't you? I should have brought my other pairs. Yeah. Okay, we need to hit those on it too. Your river of blindness is for your Jack and Cullis. Is that correct? Is that the second one, the one that's in the daytime? Oh, no, your Loa Loa is your African eye worm. Is that your river of blindness? Um, give me a minute. I think I so. A different set of cards. Those names. No, uh, it's your on, on, co, Sarah, Bovulus. On, co, Sarah, Bovulus. That's oh. the one that causes the, the blindness. The other one um, causes the swelling, the cabular swelling. So the swelling around the eye would be the low, low and the other one would be the blindness. Okay. Okay, yep, I see. I can't pronounce it right. It's that O. Yeah, the um, onterovulvus, volvulus. Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, and this one doesn't have much space, so I'm going to go to a new page. I know I did cards for them. Oh, here they are. I was like, I didn't skip skip these two, but here they are. Okay, so our first one's going to be our Lucharia. I think I always say that wrong. But. W-U-C-H-E-R-I-A. Uh, yeah, E-R-E-R-I-A. And Crofty. I can say Van Crofty. So these are going to be micro or tissue nematode. It has one intermediate host, which happens to be the mosquito. The, the good thing about these two that we're fixing to do, if you don't know the common name, the, the last name uh, in, the, in the disease usually will help for you remember that. Yes. I like the Loa Loa because it's got two Loas and you have two eyes, so you can always remember which one's the eye. So your infection um, for the Wucheria um, is going to be to identify the the microfilaria. Oh, I'm sorry, I switched them again. That's why I shouldn't write them down backwards. Um, is going to be the filariform larva. Carries blood through mosquito bite. And your disease symptoms is going to be your elephantiasis, which clogs the lymph system. And then your diagnosis 
it's going to be identify and it'll be microfilaria if it's in the blood. For the adult worm, if it's in the lymph system, lymphatic system. Important to know that this one is has increased. I think it's just overall increased at night. Let between 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. And you might find a little bit of uh, discrepancies there, like, you know, 10 to 4 or 8 to, you know, 5 or something like that. But generally, sometime overnight. Okay, we've got our picture time. And um, I need to go over microfilariae. Also, but here is your little worm and your ova. Oh, I'm sorry, these are both your worms, your microfilaria. And so um, I'm gonna pull them up online. See how dotted at places? That's how you can tell if it's a little microfilaria. And here's a better picture of it. See how the little, um, the little nuclei in it? Where? All these little dots. Oh, okay. And so, specifically for um, for your Bancrofti, the tail morphology. Let me include that too. No morphology. It's going to be sheep. And the nuclei do not extend to the tip of the tail. Okay, see all these little nuclei, these little spots all in it? That's how you can tell the difference in a microfilariae in any other, um, any other nematode. And so these, nu for the, the Van Crofty, it doesn't go to the tip of the tail. So these nuclei stop here where the tail continues on Do you see that difference? All right. And then we've got our loa loa. Which is also a microfilaria uh, nematode. And what does that mean? If it's a microfilaria nematode, I forgot. It's going to be a tissue nematode. So a it's micro a what now? A micro what? A microfilaria is a tissue nematode. Okay, got it now.
So you've got your loa loa, which is super convenient because you got two eyes and it's got two loas. Um, it's from the um, a bite from the chrysops fly. And that chrysops fly sounds a whole lot to me like a cyclops eye. Because you, whenever you think of those like cyclops, you know, okay, that's the dis defining feature of a cyclops is they only have one eye. So for me, again, that really clicks. So loa loa is the eye worm. You got two eyes, you got two loas. Um, it's more prevalent during the day, whereas your Van Crofty is more prevalent at night, more nocturnal. Your, uh, um, go ahead. So is this like a biting fly? Is it, it bite? Is. It's a blood sucking fly. Oh God. Yeah, because, and people say that this is like one of the worst places to live. They have obviously never been to the rainforest. They've never been to South America. They have never been to Africa. Um, they've never been to Australia. Oh my gosh. You want to talk about like deadly everything? Go to Australia. So people need to stop complaining because even our Texas mosquitoes got nothing on some of these like blood suckers from other places. We might have blood sucking flies here. I'm not actually sure. I think we do. You know me, I'm a little dramatic sometimes. So your method of infection is going to be the which form? Is it going to be rhabditiform or filariform? Uh, fill, 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 fill a form. Fill, fill, air, air, reform. Reform. <laughs> filariform. Yep. Filar a form. Filar. Filar I, that. that was closer. That was a whole lot closer. Someone would know what you're talking about. Um, okay. Filariform larva enters blood through a fly bite, specifically the chrysops fly. Um, your diseases and symptoms are calabar swellings, uh, which is from the migration uh, through the tissues. It's also called the African eye worm. And uh, your diagnosis is going to be to identify the microfilaria or adult worm um, in, the, um, in the patient. So if you are testing their blood, are you going to find the microfilaria or the adult worm? If you're testing for blood, you would find the microfilariae. Perfect. And if you're testing the tissue? And that's when you would do the, the adult worm. You would find the adult worm, yes. In the subcutaneous tissue, now this loa loa, it's called the eye worm because it often migrates to the ocular region. I don't know what makes it do that, why it does it, how it does it. Well, I know how it does it, but like um, it's a subcutaneous tissue worm, but often goes to the ocular region which makes it the, the eye worm. So if you get one in one eye, does that mean that you get them in both? I don't think that is necessarily true, no. Okay. And all the pictures I've ever seen have only been in one eye, but they might've just been zooming up on one, but no, I do not think that that is. Loa Loa. You're right back. Doesn't this look so much fun? That was in an episode of House. <laughs> I think I think I saw that one. I think I did. Look at that. That's nasty. Look at that. Like this. Like I can eat about and talk about this at the same time, but it's still super gross. So you see how these different, um, these are getting into some um, other ones too. So here's our Wucher area and then our Loa Loa, then your, your Brugia Malii and your Mancinella Azardi, Mancinella Perskin. See how they all have different um, nucleoli some of them are, are less um noticeable than others but like your bancrofty the nucleoli don't go or your nuclei don't go to the tip of the tail um your can you paste that to our notes this one yeah because 
I like I like how you can do, you can see the difference. Like one has a little hook on the tail, the Lola. Uh huh. And um, it it goes all the way to the tail. Well, yeah. no, it doesn't. You can't. It, well, it does except for the, like the little end piece, but it means the actual tail part. It does. Okay. See? That's just like a little, um, like membranous piece onto it. Microfilaria. So, does this one go to the end of the tail or not? Which one are we on? This one right here. Lola? Oh, yeah, that goes all the way to the end. Does it? Where's the end of their tail? right here i think it's kind of hard to see up here i think this is actually the end of the tail i was thinking right here but this is actually the end of the tail but um the end's going to be up here and they go to like right there so this oh, okay. one's going to because it doesn't actually see how this is actually the end of the tail so you can't really see the, the yeah that one's that bad, bad. Yeah. okay how about this one see how they go to the end of the tail yeah, yeah. So which one's that? Uh, isn't that the Wishkas? Wish? No, nope. I mean Lola. Wish, Lolo, Lolo. Loa, Loa. Yep. Loa, 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 Loa. Here's some pictures. So here's your um, your Wuchereria Bancrofti, and see how here's the tail, and then you still have a lot of tail that doesn't have nuclei in it. And then see here, this one has tail that doesn't right. have nuclei in it. Faint, you can faintly see an A. You can faintly see the tail that doesn't have. Yes. And then here. You've got Loa Loa, and see how they go all the way to the end of the tail. This one goes all the, here's the end of the tail. Here's the, they go all the way. They kind of get pointed. This one goes yeah, all the way. Yeah, Loa, Loa looks like it's got more of a pointed tail than West mm -hmm. Scott. Yeah, and I think that's that nuclei that give it its shape or appearance. And then here's some difference between your um, Brugia Malii. But now the so let me ask you a question. Like in our book on you don't have our book, do you? I do, actually. actually. One okay. that is the same. On, on 28, what's the difference in that fold on the tail? You know how you how it curves on 28? Is that the, the, the type of sheath? Or the sheath. Am I okay. completely off? Yeah, that's the kind of thing. curves, like... See how the Lola has like a, a double or triple fold on that tail there, but oh, then, that uh, curve, no, that curve is just to show you that they can move. That curve oh, okay. is not specific to any one species because when you're, you know, if you're flying through the blood, um, let's say you've got a bathing suit on and your bathing through suit has like a little scarf to it that looks like that, it's going to keep moving and twisting, right? Those are not specific. Right. To each different kind um, but what is is that it has a sheath or it does not have a sheath or um, which which is that kind of like extra little flowy part is that sheath and then the the nuclei where they are whether they're segmented and stuff like that okay We got Loa Loa, 
can be your African eye worm or eye worm. So you have two eyes. And you got two loas. Do we need to know that that's the black fly? Yes, you'll need to know. Um, I think you actually should know that it's a chrysops fly. Um, but if you can't remember that, at least try to remember that it is most certainly a fly, blood sucking fly. Which one is the African black fly? Is that African the black fly? Huh? African black fly? Yeah. Because that's the name of one of these, but I don't know which one it is. The river blindness? Oh, yeah, the river blindness. That's the uh, Onocostar, Onocosterica. Yes. Ball. Yeah, so you've got the black fly and the deer fly. So that's your chrysops versus your um, African black fly. And so those and are the ones that cause your loa loa in your onco circa volvulus, but they're both blood sucking flies. So I think if you can get it down to blood sucking flies cause these uh, micro filariae tissue nematodes, then I think you'll be kind of and I'm, I'm not for sure. I know they say these are from Africa, but when I lived in Georgia, we have a fly that bites that's blood sucking. Oh yeah, I'm sure there's more than just that, let's see, blood sucking flies. This deer fly looks like it could be. There's 250 species of deer fly in the genus Chrysops. Oh. So these are all subspecies of the Chrysops family. Let's see. Okay. Blood. Because I know when we lived out there, I hated those things because they they bit you, you could feel you could feel it. It wasn't like a bee sting. Yeah, you I've had them it. too, and I think that was down in Georgia. Fly, um, species. But I think the important thing they want you to know is that it's a blood sucking fly that does it, not like a mosquito or another vector. Right. Um, hey, do y'all know what kind of uh, what is a um, no, an inanimate object as a vector called. Like if you have an inanimate, yep, an inanimate object that spreads disease. A fomite. A fomite, yep. So if it's living, it's going to be like a, a vector or I think there's, um, or a, was it trans, uh, transmission host? Where if it's not um, living, then it's a fomite. So you said inanimate, what? Yeah, an inanimate is like a, um, a phone or a desk, a door handle, your keys, something that's not living that something could be on and you can get it from. So your loa loa is your African eye worm from the chrysops fly or a blood sucking fly. Um, if you can't remember that, fly rhymes with I. And that works for your, um, for your Ancha Circa Volvulus too. That's also caused by a fly. It's more prevalent during the day. Your um, method of infection, methods going to be filariform larva. And what's that? Is it, what stage is that? Like the teenager stage. It's the it's in between the adult and the and the larva. Uh huh. And is it the feeding or infective stage? Uh, feeding. Oh, yes. infection. I'm sorry, infe hey. yes, infective state. I knew you knew it, um, but yes, not feeding, it's your infective. Polariform larva enters blood through a fly bite. Your disease and symptoms. Yeah, 
going to be your calabar swelling. And this is due to um, the migration, due to the migration through the tissue. So up here it's also called the African eye worm. Diagnosis? Uh, that one. What kind of nematode is this? Um, uh, he, 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 Helman, Helmanus? Yeah, they're all Helman but specifically the kind of nematode it is. Tissue? Uh-huh, and what else is that called? It can either be called like a tissue nematode or a, starts with an M. My, uh, microfilaria. Yep, so you identify the microfilaria for adult worm. And subcutaneous tissue. Important to note that for the loa loa, the subcutaneous tissue, um, the worm often migrates to the ocular area. Can I ask? Can I ask you a question? Uh huh. When it says colon, is that the same thing as the intestines? Yes. Because a lot of these say the small intestines are intestines, but I noticed the whipworm specifically said colon. It could, well, uh, I think when they um, differentiate what they are, like specify, um, it might be more important, but I don't recall ever getting a question on like colon specifically. Okay. We already got it up here. Check the, uh... Oh, I don't want pictures. It threads into the mucosa of a colon. That is why it's called a threadworm. Threads into the mucosa of the colon. Oh, that's not even... The thread worm is the, is uh, it's the, sorry. the ladies, yeah. It's the, sorry, it's the whip worm. Yes, the whip, the whip worm. worm threads into the mucosa of the colon, sorry. I guess I'm getting tired too. Yeah, how oh, weak is that? <laughs> I feel ya. Oh, that's so gross. Y'all see that? Ooh, that's the whip one. Ooh, that is nasty. Whip one. Yeah. That's the one you see that that that's the meat. I think I've seen that before in infected meat. Which one? Is that the one that's the infected meat? Your whip, whip one? one? Or am I getting all confused now? It's easy to get them confused. Past it. There we go. It's in the um, it's ingestion, and I think it's just like normal ingestion. It's your undercooked meat is going to be your um, your uh, carnivorous one. That's your Trichinella spiralis. Okay. Which is different than the Trichuris trichuria. Okay. So often migrates to the ocular region and um, 
again, if it's a microfilariae, where is it going to be? Um, uh, uh, And the tissue? No, your microfilariae is always going to be in the blood. And your adult worm will be where? In the tissue. In the tissue, yep. 